Viking 175 on a Zenith CH750. Here's the mount. We just got started. Bolted right up. Fits real nice. Here's the Viking steel bungee that fits in between it. Got that all set up. Scraped a little bit of the paint off and put grease on like it's supposed to be. All right, so we did the mount. It's all done. And then this one ended up just loosening this bracket and that helps. And then also this one and it helps you put this bolt in. Do that at the end. And then the old pass through for the heater. We'll remove that. I'm going to drill and use it as a pass through for our connections. All right, so we got the front done. Actually, move the temp probe down here so we can vent the engine as high as possible. So it we went here, and then this goes to the bottle. We get the gearbox bottle. That one is mounted higher because we want, if there's ever any fluid in there, we want it to drain back to the to the gearbox. And I'm gonna keep trucking along here. Maybe we'll uh, start hooking up the heater. We got the hoses already. So if we put a heater in here, then we can uh, finish that up. Uh, did do the positive and negative pass-throughs. Right there for the negative. And here for the positive. And we got one from the alternator, one for the starter for the positive. Since this got the big engine, we're gonna put the batteries in the back. So for right now, we just got pass-throughs ground and positive. All right, so the cables come in through the pass-through and um, I made a bracket over here to um, hold the ECU. Plugged in the ECU and then grouped the wires for that. It's always a little bit harder to work on an existing installation. Um, lots of wires that go <clears throat> to stuff that we are not using anymore and things like that but that's okay all right so just like other installations uh tanks are all the same but uh let's review it it's going to go into a 175 we got it built up with the piece in the front here bent at like 135 a couple of braces here a couple of braces here and then it's ready to hang on the cross brace from those. We have put a plate over here where we can add a term terminal strip or a bus bar and a terminal strip and the check valve assembly. Here's the four inch uh, fuel transducer for this tank and a pump and another pump and some brass fittings. Let's look at the details. Um, Tank one, feed and vent. In fact, you can use these four any which way you want, but you're gonna have two feeds from the main tanks and two vents. And all the holes are, they go into the tank, so you can use any one for any purpose, but that's why there's four, two and two. The last one here, all systems now use a little bleed back. It's a 10,000 orifice right here. And we just take some high pressure fuel and bleed it back through that into the tank that way, in the hose that goes to the engine, after shutdown, slowly the fuel will bleed off. And there's less chance of getting boiling fuel out of the engine, and it'll be easier to start the engine. And no pressure in the hoses when the airplane's parked. Uh, all right, so that covered the brass fittings. And then, like I said, we have the 4-inch fuel transducer. The, that's wired with one wire to ground. This is going to be our ground bus. And one wire going like to our terminal strip so that we can put the signal wire from the other side and run it up front to our gauge. The fuel pumps have a positive on the left side facing the pump like that and a negative on the right side facing it. And that's true with the other pump as well, even though it's oriented the other way positive on the left with the connector on the edge of the pump and negative. So those go over here. We have a negative for one pump, a negative for another pump. And, like I, and then this one was for the fuel pressure transducer, a negative and a negative. I'm just spreading them out like that. They can be on one screw or whatever, but as long as we 
evenly spread it out, then once we put our ground cable into here, then everything will have ground. So that takes care of the ground. On the positive side of the pumps, we have two wires as well. Uh, one from this pump, one from this pump. We're putting them here and here, waiting for wires going up to the circuit breakers and then to the switches for the pumps. So we can turn them on and off on the instrument panel. So that covers the wiring of the system. The fuel, we have high pressure coming out here, high pressure coming out here. We built up this little block and this one I uh, just oriented with, uh, put a couple of holes here, some spacers, some AN3 bolts and just kind of elevated it a little bit to about the height of, of this so that the hoses would look nice. And then I have on one side, I have the check valve and check valve and 516's barb and 516's barb screwed in, hose to that pump, hose to this pump using the Oetica clamps. This side we have the five bar, zero to five bar pressure transducer for the fuel pressure. Behind that here, facing up in the air, we have a 90 degree fitting and that goes into the bleed that goes back into the tank. If the bleed is here or the bleed is here and then you do a 90, it doesn't really matter to me. It could be either way, but it just needs to have a 10 thousandths bleed orifice in this return line back into the tank. And then over here we have put a 90 with a 516 barb. This hose, we're just going to lay it in here for now, have a couple extra feet, and that's going to go down into the area approximately where the flap actuator is. And we're going to put a high pressure filter there before we go to the engine. We're also going to have filters in the feed lines that go in to these. Obviously, we don't need filters in the, in the vent lines. Then after installation, we're going to do the uh, drain fitting. All right, let's install it into the airplane. All right, so we're going to put the, just like we did on Steve Salai's airplane, we put the battery tray in the back here. So one side can just kind of go all the way up against the wall. That gives it a lot of strength. And if you don't have anything here, you could actually push this thing all the way down to here because this is fairly strong going across. In this case, this was in here and the screws are glued. So I moved this back just a little bit and I added some pads in here that it's laying on. And uh, we just put a couple of screws in that. And um, that's it. So that actually it's very strong because the load is spread out over a large area. It's like I tell people when all the tools are out, you know, you're almost done with the job. The new Viking heater is absolutely insane. We've never had it on anything more than the first setting and there's three of them, but it really, really does a good job. Of course, you don't have the disadvantage of exhaust heat inside the airplane like an air-cooled engine. It's just nice, clean air using the coolant. We all have different wiring techniques. Uh, I, don't, I personally don't like this, where you just kind of wire from here to there and here to there and all that. I like it all to be like organized and follow certain patterns and all that. So this just makes it hard as a, you know, getting in there and then having our system on top of an existing system. So... We refuse to do that and just basically say, well, this is the airframe system. We'll leave that alone. We're going to do our own system. And then we leave a 30 amp fuse with an output and say, well, you can do whatever you want after this, but our system is organized and that's, that's just how we want it. Um, so yeah, uh, that way we don't have to like analyze every single wire in the whole airplane because Whatever we didn't put in or whatever's been already been put in or is being put in later, we don't care as long as it's wired after the 30 amp fuse to protect the engine. All right, so we mounted the batteries in the back and with the 175 engine up front, it's optional. Um, we just did it because there was nothing here, so we installed it and uh, moves a little bit of weight out. <clears throat> now, we didn't use much of the tray, as you can see. We didn't put the 30 amp fuse in there. We didn't really use much of this. Um, 
we just used the batteries and the contactors basically. <clears throat> then we took our wiring from the battery, the negative side, and we put it on a, um, a firewall stud, just put it right through the tray there. And they gave us a place to get grounds, one big cable going up front and one going up to ground the um, terminal strip up here for the fuel stuff. And we'll talk about that in a second. <clears throat> Other than that, we have the two batteries and the contactors. Contactors are wired exactly like up front with uh, a jumper between them, the diodes, the two wires coming in to uh, that go up front to ground the contactors and uh, to close them. And then we have the output, which is a cable that we ran up front. So there's two cables. It's the main ground cable <clears throat> and the output cable for the the main power cable going up front. And they both end up on the firewall. And we'll go and look at that in a second. Other than that, we um, had our, our big bundle of wires, about 10 wires or so, maybe 12 will be better, or, or even 15, depending on if you can also do the flap motor back here and lights and things like that. We ran those back here, and some of them were used for the fuel system. So we wired up the fuel system. We had a ground come over, like we said, from the ground at the batteries. And we had grounds right here for the fuel level and fuel pump one and fuel pump two. And then we wired fuel pump one, fuel pump two, and the center unit for the um, fuel level right there. And we also have a wire for the fuel pressure transducer. So all that was done back here. And that's really the only change that was done to do a rear battery setup. Um, initially, we thought maybe we'll have more things back here, but it made sense to have them up front. So we'll look at that. Now, as far as the fuel tank installation, it's the same as before. We have two hoses coming out on this side and two on the other side for the left and right tanks. Two of them are filtered, the feed ones, and go into the tank. And two are not filtered because they're the vent hoses that go just to the outboard fitting of the tank, of the wing tank, to get air out of the header tank. Other than that, the tank is very similar. I mean, it's the same. It's mounted the same as before with the brace across, the brace across the airplane and with the forward mount right here that's bolted through the baggage bulkhead and then the drain going through the belly of the airplane here we uh after we were done we hooked up the rudder and elevator cables again this is some something that builder did that i've never seen before some kind of a pulling to guide one of the cables, but it still has a bungee cord to keep them separated. So not sure about that, but uh, that's uh, aircraft stuff. We just do the engine. Other than that, um, fairly good build. We got some, some missing rivets here and there and stuff like that. But that's something that, uh, again, it's airframe, not, um, something that we do with that uh, biking now let's see here from the tank uh, from the high pressure side of the pumps we went into the splitter up there and let's uh, talk about that for a second because it, it's not really different but the fuel block or check valve assembly as we call it is mounted over here and we added the orifice, the 10,000s orifice back into the tank, even though it's a port injected engine. We found that just bleeding off a little bit of pressure after you shut the airplane down helps keep pressure in the lines and uh, 
keeps pressure from boiling out on the engine and the fuel rail and just makes starting actually easier rather than keeping the pressure there and then you get excessive pressure because the fuel expands in the hoses and in the fuel rail on the engine uh, so that's that's what we did so all engines will now have the little bleed back from the check valve assembly just any one of the ports and then the 10,000s orifice and then into the tank orifice can be here or here it doesn't really matter and then we have the fuel pressure transducer so we ran a wire for that and we have the check valve one there and the check valve two here <clears throat> they are then coming in from the fuel pumps fuel pump one fuel pump two fuel pumps also have check valves but we like extra check valves because we don't want one pump to feed back into the other one so just extra precaution and then we have that hose going out the high pressure one going forward and that's the one that came down over here and uh, we were looking at before we went up here uh, that's this guy so we come down and sometimes it's nice to have a 90 on the quick disconnect so we've used that there and then we go through the high pressure filter and then we go out to, we route it through and then out to the engine uh, as an unbroken line. There's no connections between here and the engine. Now, also you can see we ran our battery cables here. Um, this is like a nice place to tie them right on the edge there because there's no sharp edges like around here. And then we put a bunch of grommets in here and that allowed us to feed everything through. We got the ground cable, we got the positive cable, we got all the loom with all the different wires in it, and that's it. So now we can head up front and see the fuel system at the firewall and up to the engine, and then also how it's routed through the airplane. So let's just keep this going. We'll go inside the airplane here. Now, one thing I didn't realize um, you know, they put a couple of inspection panels here, which is nice. Um, is that with a dual stick, there's not much movement in here. Like with a single stick, there's a lot of movement in here of the controls, which makes it harder to route things through the tunnel. Uh, here, by the time we get the hoses and cables and everything attached to the sidewall here, it's... Uh, safe to run it through here and up front here we drilled just drilled a bunch of holes let's see if we can get that on the video and right in here uh, okay so let's bring the the lights forward here and we can do some more filming you can actually see what we're doing all right so we got that closed off of course that needs to be gone through by the the people that are going to be working on this plane after we're done check the pulleys and tensions and um, there's talk about which would be a really smart idea to put the the access panel in here on the side because that'll get you know real good access to doing maintenance on the fuel system uh, back here this was way too tight so in order to get these back on um, these need to now be retensioned at the right tension and new cotter pins and during transportation coming here, um, the turnbuckle got all bent on the trailer, so it needs a little work back here. Now, let's go and take a look up here. We now have lights here, so we can see the um, fuel line and the cables and everything that came through here. And we can see the, the holes that were put in order to get them right through here. Now, like I said, this is difficult if you don't have dual controls because you have so much more space here to put these holes in and then still be able to route this through the middle. And then what I did is I get the light set up a little better. I did everything like right here as far as 
make it easy to get to and all that. So we've got power going through the firewall right here. Those two cables come right through the tunnel and then one is for power here and one is for ground through the firewall. Now we can also, we also were able to back feed from there the ground back down here and to our grounding bus right there. So we put our grounding bus right here and we did the same with the positive. We came back from the main cable and we came down to make us a power bus. Now this power bus is for the airframe. You see we got the 30 amp fuse right there that's in our diagram. And then we jump over to here. So any wiring that's gonna be done now after the airplane leaves here to hook up avionics and lights and all kinds of airplane related stuff that has nothing to do with the engine all comes off of this bus right here. Um, nothing ever comes off anything else because that's for the engine. So the 30 amp is what protects the electrical system for the engine. The rest will come off of here and you can make more buses off of here. Avionics bus, whatever, light bus and all that kind of stuff. So um, we're gonna close this up now with this little cover. And that is that. Now, here, it's always good to use these screws that go through this nylon block for the steering, for the pedals. You can make them a little bit longer if you need to. And then just put something there, like a, a tube or a couple of ADEL clamps like I did. And that makes a channel in between the rudder pedals so you can route fuel lines, cables, anything that you need without it getting tangled up into the um, airplane and the mechanism and the workings of everything. We have the two main cables. We have the, the cables coming back to feed our ground bus for the airframe and the ground bus and the power bus for the airframe. And we have the fuel hose actually coming. It just continues and continues and there's no brakes in it so that we can't have a leak inside the airplane. And it just comes out here and it goes to the engine. So that's a continuous run all the way from the back um, where we just were at and all the way to the engine. And as you can see out here is where I was talking about those um, battery pass-throughs. We got the positive one and we have the negative one and we have it strain relieved so it can't break at the terminal here when we start, um, things start vibrating and the engine vibrates and all that. And then same with the, the alternator also gets routed from here over to that bus or that pass-through. And we have that strain relieved by just tying it to the alternator so this doesn't vibrate. And then our um, starter cable, we just run it across here. And then it runs down here, basically Actually, it, it, it runs up here. There was room here, it was easier. And then we came down here and we strain relief right there and we go to the starter. So usually we'll take the alternator off of here, but since the alternator and the starter is so far apart, we decided at this time to just join them right here. That was easier. All right, so that's the main power system that we routed from the back to the front. Now, as you can see, obviously this is fairly organized, but still at the end, you have to make sure your rudder pedals and all this kind of stuff, when you put the side panels on here, that everything is running without chafing. Now, we have some spare wires we bundled up. Builder can use them, they these go all the way to the back. They can be used for flap motors and things like that. We have our wires here for this panel. Okay, so here's the, the switch panel. It's gonna be mounted right here. All right, that's the traditional Viking switch panel with the switches for battery, battery, alternator, fuel pump, fuel pump, and accessory. This one is actually for the Viking view and 
the fuel gauge for the header tank. And then we have the key switch with its 25 amp breaker and five breakers for fuel pump, fuel pump, and then the um, alternator and the accessory, which is the Viking view and the header tank gauge. All right, so we're gonna set that up. That is wired by um, on the back here, and it's identical to our wire diagram. And we are routing information to that from the wires that come all the way from the back, the fuel pumps and all that, and also from the ECU, which is what we decided to mount up in here. And there's a few wires from there that come over to here, such as TAC and alternator and starter wire. And then the Viking view, which is, um, is mounted over here, has its wires from the engine to this uh, terminal strip. And then it gets its information from the sensors of the engine, the fuel transducer back at the header tank, and uh, wires from the ECU, like the TAC, only the TAC actually. Well, that takes care of that. We install the throttle. This has a center throttle because it has dual sticks. And this throttle is routed. We use a little bit longer one because by the time you actually get from the center of the airplane out to here and then come down and come up at a right angle to the holder here. It looks like we used the second hole in and then we got that set up, snapped on here, and we set our idle screw here, and we made sure we had the, uh, the full throttle when it, where it hits up here. And that takes care of the throttle cable, and it was just tied to a couple of places on the engine. And then through the firewall, and we put loom on it because it chafes something terrible like this stuff here. You don't want that to rub against anything. As you can see too, it was it made sense to put the starter relay up front here rather than on the back because the wires to the starter and the key uh, all ended up being much shorter. Now as you see, this is <clears throat> somewhat finished yet temporary. So we got a fuel gauge there, we've got Viking view, we've got a little LED just stuck in there. We have our panel just kind of used self-tapping screws, um, took the place of an existing instrument. So clearly this is, you know, the, this is intended, like he, our customer said, uh, to have a new panel. Uh, it had a different engine, it had a, like a Continental engine before. It never flew, um, hasn't been flown, and it's not ready to fly. But um, so that was taken out and um, a lot of things like like wires up here we have no idea what, what they're for and where they go a lot of them are uh, cut and they were for the old engine uh, old instruments engine engine instrumentation stuff like that so uh, we've only done what was Viking stuff uh, basically this little bundle right here to feed this panel which is our main panel we got the heater in there and we got a heater switch right here and we wired of course the uh, new Viking view and uh, put the ECU for the engine in it is right there mounted that made a mount for that uh, routed our stuff through the firewall as far as the now let's see, let's get a bit of you here. And right there. Made a firewall pass through for the ECU wires. And uh, we have a throttle cable going through right there. And a fuel hose going through right there in a grommet. And then we have the pass throughs for the power over here nice and organized but all this other stuff I don't know 
I think at some point it was probably somewhat organized, but well, clearly all needs to be, be redone. And then out here, um, we're not going to get involved with like things like the, the old stuff that was removed. Uh, all the holes obviously has to be patched up, uh, things like that. But the basic installation of the Viking engine is uh, uh, went really well. And it's, we're going to start it up and run it. And the fuel system has all been done. Here are the hoses. This is a new way of putting in the hoses. Um, used to do more of a like drill through this upright here. Uh, up in that corner and run them up, up in that corner. We've since found that we have a lot better drainage by just going at, constantly going downhill like that. Now this is one way of doing it, just tying the hoses together. Another, of course, is to just take a little piece of rectangular aluminum tubing or a couple of pieces of round aluminum tubing and just kind of make something there that looks structural like a tubular airplane and then feed the hoses through it. And then out here, um, there's a fuel feed that goes through the filters and a vent on each side. And that doesn't, that's not filtered. So that goes to the outboard part of the tank up by the fuel cap. And this goes to the uh, fuel strainer uh, down at the bottom, the pickup in the fuel tank. And so that has to be finished by putting in bulkhead fittings or something right here and um, finished off. Next, we're going to install our radiator on the belly. Now, this is in the way of that, so we're going to put them on the inside. We'll just take those rivets out, take the left one, put it over on the other side, and vice versa, and then rivet them back in so they're out of the way on the belly. All right, we got the radiator up and mounted. It's pretty turned out nice. Look how sealed it is in the back there. That's because we're using a, a new piece here now. We're not necessarily closing off this back in fact a little bit of turbulence here is good more cooling but this piece up in here is a new piece it's made for a wider radiator but I just trimmed it a little bit on each side and rebent it so that it fit in here and it has the notches for that so, and then I glued it to the radiator with right stuff but not to the airplane and turned out good and we got here here and here I had to uh, shave off a couple of rivets right up in there. I'll re-rivet them from the inside. But other than that, it fit real nice. Of course, the front is going to be lined up with the second rivet in there on each side. And other than that, um, I was going to show you something. Pull the, pull the locking mechanism. As you can see, the engine mount's real close here. So we're going to have to go with a 90 here that snaps on here. But this 90 is really designed to go like maybe over there uh, because these keyways, this one and this one, they stick out equal on both sides. And that's not true with the, um, let's see if we can see it with the trough here. See, this one sticks out further it, than that one. So yeah, see that one has like a built out area and this one does not. So this one, we can't have the keyway go out quite as far which is on the co-pilot side, so we're going to take our razor knife and just take a little bit of that off. And it's easiest to test it with this locking mechanism pulled out when you push it on the first few times. And it's really the same on this side. It's, uh, it doesn't drop down easy this way, but you turn it the other way, and there it is. And I have it lubricated with O-ring grease. And that's it. So the same on that side. It should snap right in. Basically, the lock um, is pulled pulled out on the co-pilot side on both sides. That's how it's facing. All right. So we did the hoses on this side. We got a very short 45 here, and then a 90 into there with a spring clamp on this one, and. Um, a three inch coupler in here and we did a, a, a large tie wrap here just to kind of hold it back a little bit because the cowling is going to be right here 
Now, there's another 175 installation on Steve Sly's airplane. That's very similar for the routing. Um, I used uh, a 45 out of here this time. And we put a little three inch coupler in another 45. And we were able to kind of like just follow this. Put a six inch piece in here and another 45. And um, cut that hanging on a one and three quarter hanging clamp on that, put a double nut on there. And there's the thermostat facing the radiator. It's important. And there's a mark which goes up. And when you look through it, there's a hole on top of the thermostat. That's what goes up. And we got yet another 45 going over this way. Uh, six inch piece in there and another 45. So basically all 45s on this side. One, two, three, four, five of them to make it work. Turned out good. All right, this engine has a standpipe here. So we tape the funnel in there and now we can fill the engine with coolant. And this engine takes the coolant really quickly because the, the venting is in the right place and there's very little, if any, burping. It just runs right in, which is good. Here's a little detail we missed. So there's the, the three bolts that hold the header tank, the front bracket. All right, when you start fitting the cowling, make sure that the little bell housing areas, the things that protrude, especially on the pilot side, that they're not hitting the cowling. So that just makes it really hard. Uh, you think you've got the cowling in the right place, the bottom cowling, and then it might actually not pull up because it's hitting this. You can just use a port a band or a saw saw with a fine blade and just trim this off. All right, so we've completed most things. We just put some vents in. Those are important because a lot of heat in these uh, liquid cool engines stay in that cowling. So somehow you need to be able to vent that out after landing. Um, either with a door that can open up or, or vents like these. Um, these work good because they also work in flight. And then uh, I'm gonna put the spinner on yet, but other than that, hinges are all done. Lots of videos on that. I just cut an opening for the gearbox. And now I'm gonna pencil in and cut the, the tailpipe. We don't want that so long. We just want it slightly below that, maybe like here. And um, most of the air, well, all the air that cools the radiator goes go up inside here underneath. And then air that go into the cowling, we wanna exit before it gets to the radiator. So. We have openings for that on the sides, on both sides. So that's it. He's ready to go. All right, so we got got this whole finished. Whose plane was this? Uh, Maurice Garner. All right, Maurice. He is... bought it used uh, from somebody else and is replacing the engine. Okay. Well, there's a lot of things that are not airworthy. I mean, there's. I hope they're not going to fly anytime soon, but there's a lot, just a lot of wires and stuff and things that need to be bundled. And it's not a bad built airplane, but just. It's a got lot. a long way to go. It's got a long ways to go, yeah. Um, now, we did uh, our normal installation, and we didn't really touch any of the other stuff, but we do have a nice header tank in the back. We've got battery systems in the back because we got the 175 engine, so we put a couple more things in the back battery fuel tank. And then up front here, we have the, the um, switch panel and the wiring that's associated with that and the engine. Um, we show that, of course, in our video. So let's fire it up, we're ready. Um, just bled the fuel system. Now we turn 
battery. We got switches here, battery, battery, alternator, fuel pump, fuel pump, and instrumentation. Um, now I want to point one thing out, like since this plane is going to somebody else and I think it's going to go to an avionics shop and then it's going to go uh, to probably like, you know, whatever, upholstery, somebody's going to help. It's going to have a bunch of different hands Yeah, in. a lot of people are going to be working on this thing. But then the only thing that's really, really important to us is that the nobody t tees into the electrical system that can knock out the engine since it's an electrically dependent engine and we have dual of everything. Um, so right here is the, I made a, a bus here, a positive bus. It's got the 30 amp fuse and then the third, and then a 30 amp bus here. From here you can run positive wires and make your own buses for like avionics and lights and all that kind of stuff. But you can't tee power directly to the battery cables. You, this is it. The, this is the place where you get power for the rest of the airplane. And it's then the engine is then protected by the 30 amp breaker or fuse, like it shows in our wire diagram. So I just wanted to point that out. Let's get both batteries on and a fuel pump. Throttle is at idle. And clear prop. We'll fire it up. <laughs> I did also want to mention, if it's not mentioned, I know that he plans on changing out that throttle cable. He mentioned some kind of thro throttle quadrant type situation and stuff too, so that Okay, might... well, I, I professionally installed this one and it has the right end uh, here and uh, the correct... Okay, correct... I just think that's what he's doing. Well, later. it's got a correct end at the other end, so hopefully there's not going to be any anything other than that. But yeah, some people like quadrant, uh, somehow rig that in here. All right, cool deal. Yeah. That's a wrap. leaves.